Good. Well, should we get rolling, Diane? Sounds like a plan, Doug. Super. Well, um, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, looking forward to sharing with you a little bit about what we've learned about Hartley um, and the vegetation first and foremost there at the natural area and the park and talk a little bit about, uh, again, what we've learned and uh, what we're thinking and recommending at this point with regard to opportunities and needs for management and restoration. For those joining late, uh, we are recording the meeting. Um, so you probably saw a window about that to accept that to continue. But uh, let's go ahead and get started here. So the agenda for tonight, we've got an hour, I think an hour and a half blocked out for this. I don't think it'll take that long to get through it all, but we have that time available if needed. Um, we'll quickly go through a few introductions. Um, and we'll have a couple questions for you folks. We just want to get a better sense as to who our audience is today for this, uh, for this meeting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the purpose of the project, some of the, the goals and outcomes and the structure of how this project has been moving forward over the last several months. Some of our findings um, in terms of the vegetation and the management units that we came up with for identifying portions of the park and some of the draft um, recommendations. Um, and then we've got time for questions and answers towards the end. So, uh, Quick introductions. Uh, Diane, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Mute, you're muted. See, I'm still not good at it. <laughs> Hi, folks. I'm Diane Desatel. I'm the City of Duluth's Natural Resources Coordinator and um, managing the project from, from that end of things. Great, thanks. Tom, you want to quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Hi, Tom O'Rourke, Executive Director of Hartley Nature Center, one of the city's primary partners. Hartley is our home. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Doug Mansing. I'm with Applied Ecological Services. I'm a senior ecologist, um, and we've had the good fortune of being able to work with Diane and the whole uh, city and Hartley Nature Center team on the project. And then, uh, Sean, you can introduce yourself as a team member. Yeah, I'm Sean Jurgens. I'm a landscape architect at SRF Consulting, part of the team with, with Doug and Applied Ecological Services. And I am helping out with some of the support on public engagement and outreach. Great, thank you. And then just as you see on the slide here, there's several other technical advisors who have been helping us out throughout the project. Uh, we, we've leaned heavily on these folks, um, Matt, Jim, Clark, Brandon, and Pat. Um, all having different um, histories and perspectives, uh, but a lot of local knowledge specific to Hartley uh, that's been just invaluable in, uh, in putting this plan together um, thus far. Uh, so we want to, again, just get a little bit of a sense as to the audience and who's joining us today. Uh, so poll question number one here is popping up on your screen, hopefully, um, just about you know the ways you enjoy Partly natural area and the park. And uh, you can choose multiple answers. We'll give people pull a few more moments here and then we'll look at the results. So did the results pop up there for you? Um, yeah. Looks like the winner is walking or hiking, but we got a very good um, uh, variety of, of interests. And as, as you all know, there are a lot of opportunities for recreation and nature enjoyment at Hartley, so that's great to see. Yeah, pretty high with uh, the biking, cross-country skiing, the trail use in general. Um, lots of nature appreciation. Great. Super. Um, then, let's see here. 
Can I move on to the next polling question here? And can you launch that second? Yeah, so you've heard a little bit about us. We'd like to hear a little more about our participants tonight. So this question, where do you folks live? Uh, with, within a half a mile of Hartley, elsewhere in Duluth or outside of the Duluth area? It looks like we have a almost an even split. A lot of folks, uh, a little more than half, live very close to Hartley and the rest within Duluth. All right, great. And then uh, just the last polling question. You can remain, remain anonymous if you want to keep your age to yourself, but uh, <laughs> we just want to get a general sense as to who's on the call and this helps us just understand a little bit more again, the folks involved and able to join us tonight, so. All right, super, great. great. Well, thank you, thank you for uh, humoring us and giving us a little bit more information about who you are and um, we'll just keep going here. So what is the purpose of this, of this project overall? So to develop a native plant community management plan that will document restoration and management goals and methods and identify priority projects for costing and phased implementation over the next 10 years. That's a bit of a mouthful, but it's important to kind of lay that out, that that's the real purpose of this project. This is not like other natural resource management plans that address a lot of other issues. We tried to be inclusive and somewhat holistic in our approach, um, but it's really focusing on the native plant communities and how those exist today and how those should be managed into the future to achieve um, the natural areas and the city's goals for those, for those resources. <laughs> Um, so in terms of goals and outcomes, you know, in a nutshell, we really want to just understand those existing conditions better in terms of the plant communities and the eco ecosystems um, within the natural area and within the park. Uh, define the needs that are presented by those natural systems and those plant communities and their current condition. And then develop a prioritized and phased implementation plan. And the way the project has been structured, and we've been moving through this, getting started about back in May, um, we looked at existing data. Uh, a lot of good uh, reports had been done and research had been done on um, Hartley Natural Area and within the park. Um, <clears throat> a presentation was made to the Natural Resources uh, Commission um, back in, I think that was back in June. And then we started looking at um, management units and the types of restoration work that's going to need to be done within the park to address um, the uh, native vegetation needs. We started thinking about um, timeline and costs and how this work would get done. And now we're in this phase of developing the draft plan. Um, and having this posting this public meeting to get folks um, up to speed on what we've been up to and uh, get some input from people as well. Then the final plan is slated to be uh, completed, um, kind of a final draft in November, presenting to that to the Natural Resources Commission at meeting number two with them, and then a final presentation of the final plan in early December. So findings, what have we learned about the park? Again, a lot of you folks spent, have spent a lot more time um, in the park and the natural area than we have, but we have gotten boots on the ground. I had a great tour from Matt um, of the park and then did a little hiking around myself also. Um, but between that and the previous reports and studies that have been done and some uh, additional research that we did, 
you know, we have just learned a lot about the park and we always want to start kind of big picture holistically understanding the ecological context of a natural area such as Hartley. So, um, you know, where is it located within the city? It's that red blob and in, in red outlined blob here in the city map of Duluth showing the other um, parks within the city's park system. Um, and then, you know, we wanted to, uh, and it's also worth noting here that uh, we're, we, we are focusing on the Hartley natural area, which is the vast majority of the park. But this study also is including portions of the park that are not in the natural area. Um, so that's, uh, that's, you'll see maps later that show that in a little bit more detail. Um, but, you know, we're in an area that the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has defined as the North Shore Highlands Ecological Subsection. Um, and that characterizes kind of the eco region that we're in here. You know, we've got a, a cold, moist climate for the most part, relatively thin soils um, over what's often very shallow bedrock. You see some outcrops here in the, in the photo. Um, the uplands are dominated by silt loams in terms of the soils, and you've got more mucky soils and organic soils in the lowlands. So these things are all useful for understanding um, the historical context of the landscape and um, the native plant communities that are there today and what are appropriate communities in the future. Prior to European settlement in the uh, early to mid 1800s, the area had mixed hardwood and pine forests. So species like maple and white pine and basswood were very common. Some of those are still very common in portions of the park today. Um, and then um, I'll go into a little bit more detail on the vegetation in a moment, but you know it's it's very apparent looking at the data that's been collected thus far that there's um, you know some very high quality native plant communities and some really nice remnants uh, within the natural area and within the park, um, but there's also a lot of significantly disturbed landscapes as well, <clears throat> and a lot of those have been compromised by very aggressive invasive species. Um, and then you see. Uh, critter here and a plant. Just wanted to also mention there are some rare plant and animal records within the natural area in the park. Um, bats and there's a photo here of the, the lynx. Um, the narrow triangle moonwort is photographed here. Um, but some neat um, neat animals and plants within the park to note that these are either in, in or nearby. And so when we're talking about the native plant communities, we're not just focusing only on plants. These are also, of course, the habitats of these, of these, uh, of these species, both plants and animals. So the, again, the vegetation is really the focus of this. And um, NRRI did a really detailed study of the vegetation throughout the natural area um, a couple of years ago. And uh, we took that information and we made it a little bit more generalized um, land cover classification or plant community classification that's shown here. Um, still very complicated park and natural area um, in terms of a very uh, complex mosaic of different plant communities, um, upland forests, lowland forests, shrublands, some grasslands, uh, a variety of wetland types, etc. Um, and then of course the trail network is also shown on this on this map as well. Just a couple of the photographs from walking around the site. You can see some of the exposed bedrock, um, some of the um, deciduous forest, some of the mixed, mixed coniferous deciduous forest, pine plantation on the lower right. Um, obviously that's a very uh, significantly altered habitat and, and there's been some work done to start uh, transitioning those over to a more natural and native forest types. So that was some of the uplands and some of the lowlands include sh some shrub swamps, um, a wet meadow shrub car. Uh, the lower left is one of the vernal pools within the park. And then the lower right here shows the edge of Hartley Pond. So that's kind of what is there. So when you talk about a natural resources inventory, a plant community inventory, that's what is there. And a related but a separate question is what is the quality of those those native plant communities or natural areas? Um, and so again, this is based on the work that NRRI did um, looking at the quality of these different plant communities. 
And this uses a standard system um, that's been adopted by the Minnesota DNR and is used by many natural resource agencies across the United States. Um, a, a relatively simple A through D grading score, A being you know, exceptional high quality remnants um, and D being quite poor quality. Um, still, you can recognize it as being or historically was a native plant community, um, but it's relatively uh, or significantly degraded. And that usually, not always, but that usually is largely driven by the presence of invasive species. <clears throat> So this map shows your highest quality area, um, or some of the highest quality areas include the large wet meadow and car down the south central portion of the natural area. That's a big wetland complex. That's really quite high quality. Up in the northwestern portion, you've got some quite a bit of BC quality, which is considered high quality forests, a variety of forest types up in there. Um, and then also some other BC or that light green colored high quality forests down in kind of the southeastern portion. And then the yellow areas are more C quality. And then you start to get into the orange, which is CD or poor quality. And the D is the more severely degraded areas. Now the areas that show up as gray, these are, these are um, not even considered native plant communities. So they're not given a quality rank. Um, and these are considered to be essentially non-native species or completely altered types of habitats. Um, and some of these are just severely so far degraded that there's really not much left of the, the native plant community that was once there. And so they are not given a quality rank. Oh, and I should mention if there's questions or comments, I think during this presentation, um, we thought it might be most efficient for me to run through things, um, but feel free to type a, a question or comment into the chat. We can circle back to that as well, um, or we can just you know, address that during the questions and answer period. But if you feel like you're gonna forget the question later on, you can throw it in the chat and we'll keep track of that and, and visit that later on. So um, again, as I mentioned, the existing quality, um, something that, was very apparent uh, the the moment I entered the park uh, was you know some of the in the very aggressive and in, invasive buckthorn that's present there both the uh, both the glossy buckthorn as well as the common buckthorn and there's a number I think there's I don't know there's I think over 20 recorded invasive species throughout the park um, buckthorn um, glossy and common buckthorn are just a couple of them but they're quite apparent and they're quite dense in, in many of the forest areas the poorer quality forest areas, I should say. Many forests have very little buckthorn, I'm pleased to report. Um, past management. So because of the invasive species and the history of alteration that's taken place um, throughout some portions of the natural area, um, there's been management activities that have gone on. And this has been done um, by a, a, a variety of folks. Hartley Nature Center has been involved in this, um, as well as um, Brandon, um, I'm, I'm I'm spacing on Brandon's organization. What's community the name of action, that? Again? Community Action Duluth. And Thank you. Remind, community remind Action Duluth. folks, this goes back just about five years. Okay. Um, so I know they've done a lot of the work here. Um, and so what's shown in the hatched area basically are, are those areas where this past management has taken place. So largely in this, um, you know, around the nature center, um, and in some of the pine plantations um, in the central portion and northeastern portion of the natural area in the park. These are just a couple photographs. Uh, in the upper left, this is some of the, the recent brushing work that's been done. I believe this was by Brandon's crews, um, cutting it and piling it, getting ready to burn it um, over the winter. Um, but it can substantially change the character um, and the structure of these communities. And so after you remove that, you need to think about how are you going to keep it out, keep the re-sprouts out, keep the seedlings out and replant that. And the photo in the lower right shows an area where um, you can see a brush pile there kind of um, behind that first tree to the right. So there was some larger buckthorn that had been cut from this area and brush piled, but the brush piles haven't been burned yet. And you can see very aggressively that the uh, that brush re-sprouts, the stumps can re-sprout. Um, often those are painted with herbicide, 
but even with herbicide treatments, um, there's uh, often seedlings are going to grow like crazy after you remove the larger buckthorn and you get a real flush. And so you need to stay after this. Um, we've seen on a number of sites, even with regular management, you have to really stay on top of some of these sites for seven years sometimes before the seed bank gets exhausted. Um, so you have to really be aggressive um, about removing it and then staying on top of it because if you do a cut and then you walk away, you're going to be left with this and this is going to grow very rapidly into a much more mature and dense um, understory of invasive brush. So um, we, we often will take, you know, large and complicated sites like Hartley and break them into management units. Um, and so we did just that. Uh, we worked with a number of the folks on the team with the city and the Hartley Nature folks. And uh, we came up with these nine management units. And these are not really prioritized. Uh, the, the numbers are really just for identification purposes. But by considering the existing plant communities, some of the cultural land cover types, um, we rely heavily on roads and trails so that these can be clearly defined and navigated in the field by crews. Um, we also considered some of the previously managed areas and we also took ecological quality ranks into consideration. Um, but these are still, even though we've broken this, you know, the, the, the site into nine areas, some of these are still very large. Uh, they range from 10 to 115 acres in size. And when it gets down to it, um, you know, usually projects, an individual project will get done on a much smaller area or a subset of a management unit, or it might go over boundaries between management units. But this is still a useful tool to break the site up into uh, portions and to think about management and how that takes place over time um, and to just be able to track progress and things. But uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the subunits or the actual work areas in a moment. So um, our draft recommendations, one of the big things that um, we work with our clients on with projects such as this is project prioritization. Um, everybody has limited resources to do things. So, you know, there's not um, endless, endless finances to just go ahead and do what you want to do in any order. Um, you need to think really strategically about what you want to do and where you want to do that. And how you come up with those um, priorities and how you make those decisions can vary on um, depending on a variety of factors or considerations. So we've basically broken those into um, considerations dealing with locational issues, cultural considerations, and then specific actions or tasks that might be considered. And I'll just go through each of those a little bit more in detail. So location considerations, so these have a geographic element to them. These might be high public visibility areas or higher quality native plant communities. Um, maybe there's rare plants or rare animals that use some of these habitats. Uh, are there sensitive wildlife? Um, one important one um, that a lot of people don't think of right away is a light or an early infestation of a highly invasive plant. Um, that is something that really warrants attention um, from an ecological restoration perspective. Um, most people would think, oh, go to the worst places first. Um, and there's some advantages to doing that. However, you can spend a lot of money on a small area that's highly infested and quite frankly might really pretty much be almost a lost cause um, in terms of the native plants that are there and this, the, the functioning of that native plant community might be so far gone um, that it would be much better ecologically and much more cost effective to go to areas that have early infestations and prevent those invasive species from getting a foothold. Um, and so that suggests looking at your higher quality natural areas early in the process um, and focusing resources there, and those resources can often cover a lot of ground and a lot of acreage. Um, I'm getting an echo, so I'm not sure if there's an a open mic that's causing that. Okay, I think it stopped. Um, so uh, some other considerations, you know, where past invasive um, species work and other restoration work has taken place. Um, 
you again, as I mentioned earlier, you don't want to do work in an area and then walk away for several years because uh, often that work will be for naught. And so um, staying on top of those and sticking with areas that have had past investments is, is a wise consideration. Um, considering things like downstream water quality and, and water storage, how these systems um, behave, how they recharge groundwater, um, and how that relates to aquatic resources is another consideration. Um, and then along trail corridors, this is often where invasive species uh, spread and get into areas. And so sometimes that's an area where you want to focus your uh, limited budget to address, um, address restoration and management activities. Some of the cultural considerations, um, you know, some of these areas are used for recreation. You want to think about how are they used today and how might restoration activities affect those rest recreational, um, recreational uses. Safety obviously is always a factor in, in public park lands um, and, uh, and sometimes uh, ecological restoration uh, can make areas more safe um, by making visibility better. Um, there's sometimes regulatory requirements with regard to doing this type of restoration and management work. And obviously there's educational opportunities, engaging folks um, for education and working with volunteers and such. And then sometimes um, there's specific actions or tasks that people want to do, um, regardless of where geographically in the park it is. Um, so maybe you want to target a particular invasive plant. Maybe you want to, you know, remove all of the, you know, all of the common buckthorn within Hartley Park, which would be a huge undertaking, but that's a discrete task that would take place everywhere. Um, and so, uh, uh, and, and another one, you know, when you've got a Minnesota Department of Agriculture um, noxious or invasive uh, noxious weed, um, you know, that's that's an action that would be taken to address that regulatory requirement, um, and that would be uh, site wide. So keeping those all of those different criteria or considerations in mind, um, we came up with a kind of a course prioritization tiers, these three levels or tiers of prioritization that were based on um, a number of those considerations. So um, using uh, tier one as the highest priority, that was largely driven by um, the highest quality natural areas. If you remember that quality ranking map from earlier, that shows um, that these, these three kind of green areas represents the highest quality natural areas. So again, this is where with limited resources, um, a lot of good can be done and you're really protecting the higher quality areas within Hartley. Tier two um, is focused as you can see, that's, that was similar to that black hatched area you saw on an earlier map. That tier two is largely where previous investments have been made in, um, in doing uh, ecological restoration and management work. So there's already been um, invasive removals and native plantings and, and management has taken place and we want to make sure that that continues in the short term. And then tier three, the yellow zone was identified um, and what that does is it help to, helps to connect and coalesce these areas over time. So they weren't the highest quality areas, they, previous management hadn't taken place there, but by by focusing management in those tier three areas after tiers one and two are under control would be a logical way to move forward um, with, uh, with implementing restoration management across the site. So those tiers, those three tiers were then broken down or we considered within those three tiers, uh, the actual priority projects. And this was based on um, a lot of the work um, that that Diane and Brandon had compiled and put together. These are <clears throat> some discrete areas within the park. There's kind of 16 here. The fourth one down, the pollinator meadows, there's actually three pollinator meadows, but if you group that as one, there's 16 priority project areas that were identified. Um, and those, uh, the acreages of each are shown in the right-hand column. So this, you know, shows about 100 and 120 acres or so that's been identified of priority projects within the Hartley site. And this map shows geographically where those are located. 
<clears throat> so again, this basically encompasses the tier one and tier two areas, the highest quality areas and the areas where previous management has taken place. So just to describe these in a little bit more detail, in the tier one zone, which was up in that Northwest unit, those are high, you know, high quality forests. We, they, they were rated as BC quality, um, mostly upland forests. Um, and that, that's where a lot of blowdown damage took place um, a couple years ago. And so uh, the Nature Conservancy is working on a project up there where they are cutting and treating some of the buckthorn that has um, invaded there. It's not very dense, but it is, in there, it is present. Um, and they're working on interplanting a variety of native long-lived tree species to fill in the canopy gaps that have resulted from that. And they're also trying, by, by removing the buckthorn and planting the desirable long-lived native trees, they're um, interfering with uh, the buckthorn's attempts to get a foothold there. Um, so that's, uh, that's exciting work to hear that that's moving forward with the Nature Conservancy. That South Central unit, this is the wet meadow or car or shrub swamp area. Um, again, this is quite high quality overall. Um, it does have some patches of reed canary grass and invasive cattail. Um, and getting those under control now um, would be good. Again, with limited resources and limited effort, um, that could be uh, basically those, those few small areas of invasives could be turned around. Um, and you protect the remainder of this high quality natural area from, be, from being compromised by those invasive species. Then there was that southeast unit. Um, that's mostly uh, upland forest types of the B to BC quality. So moderate to high quality uh, forests. And again, there's not a tremendous amount of buckthorn in those in most of those areas, um, but it does warrant some intervention and some treatment and management. Then we didn't list out here all of the tier two projects. These are just some of the examples um, to give you a flavor of what those look like. Um, the tier two projects included the pollinator meadows. Um, there's three of those listed here. And those are areas that have already been established and they're already under kind of a long-term management regime. So um, there may be opportunities in the future for en enhancing their diversity, but to continue doing some weeding, um, um, whether that's hand pulling or spot control of weeds and things um, to make sure those pollinator meadows continue to thrive and stay on a trajectory to becoming um, even more mature and diverse uh, pollinator uh, grasslands and meadows. Um, again, there's several pine plantations within the site. Um, brushing and planting is largely what's going on in those areas. Um, uh, again, removal of the buckthorn that's invaded around the pine trees and then doing some interplanting. Some of these areas, uh, some of the pine plantations also were damaged in the blowdown. They've kind of, Mother Nature kind of helped out a little bit by maybe taking down some of those trees. And then um, there will be uh, replanting, uh, again, similar to what's going up in the north, what's going on up in the northwestern portion of the site. There will be some interplanting of long-lived native tree species in those areas um, and ongoing management of the invasive species. Um, and then around Hartley Nature Center, um, just ongoing enhancement opportunities in some of those areas that's kind of on the edge in a historically disturbed portion of the site. And so there are some well-established invasive species there. So uh, continuing to enhance those different plant communities um, since it is high visibility area, it's also relatively easy to get volunteers to work in those areas near the Nature Center. So then we have to think about, well, how do we, how do we phase this work in? Again, we're talking about a lot of acreage, um, a lot of work. Um, the tier one, those three priority projects in green in the map below here, that totals about 153 acres. Now, most of that we've estimated is really pretty high quality. Most of that we know is high quality. And we're estimating maybe about 18 acres or so really require a bit more concerted effort. Um, but still, you've got to kind of cover that area to survey it for invasives and to manage those invasive species and address any other um, issues. <clears throat> the tier two in pink, 
Um, again, we've uh, identified these um, priority project areas. Um, about 152 acres is encompassed within that area. And then tier three, we didn't break out specific projects within that, um, but those generally those two areas totals about 60 acres. And then we're not even addressing in any way, shape or form the remainder of the, of the park um, and the natural area, which amounts to over 300 acres of the area that's shown still in gray here. And this is just kind of a, a bit of a cartoon. It shows those priority projects off to the left here um, with their acreages. And the colors in this chart kind of show one way to implement these over the course of a 10 year plan. And again, this is a draft. Uh, we've started to work with some opinions of probable cost, which are some rough cost estimates. Um, there's lots of assumptions and there's some unknowns included in those. Um, but what it helps is to lay out a plan as to how these different priority projects would be addressed. Um, you can see the graph, um, or the, the chart here shows that usually a given project requires, um, usually phased in over the course of a few years, like three years or so. Um, and then there's some um, more significant establishment management, we call that um, in the blue, the light blue color, followed by long-term management. And so, you know, you need to think about how much money do you have in the first year, let's say 2021, how much money do you have and how far down this priority list can you go? And then you can't bite off more, you don't want to bite off more than you can chew financially. And so you want to uh, phase that in over time. And as you go from the green to the blue to the orange, your costs per acre are reduced because it becomes easier. It's less, less um, intensive in terms of the effort um, that these are these projects are typically front loaded in terms of their effort, the effort required. So um, you can see over time you transition um, into establishment management and into the long-term management, which is a relatively low cost per acre management phase. And as you do that, you can take on more projects and you basically over time get more projects. So this graphic is showing conceptually that all of the priority projects that we've identified in tier one and tier two would at least be have begun um, within a 10 year time frame. But um, that, you know, that requires a significant commitment and investment to accomplish that. And if you want to do it more aggressively, you would need more funds or more volunteers or more grants. Um, and, uh, and so it starts to put things into perspective as to how that how that would play out. And so we'll continue to work with the team in the city on how this, how the costs tie into this and how things get um, phased in over the course of a 10 year plan. So that is um, a lot of information. Hopefully most of that makes sense. So we uh, wanted to throw out a quick question here for folks about, um, you know, after hearing that, Hopefully you've got a better understanding of, of the designation of Hartley as a natural area and why native plant community management um, will improve those ecological conditions. So um, we'll see if we've got any folks that need questions answered or aren't convinced or, uh, but please answer honestly. We're happy to have a discussion and, and feel some pushback. Well, all right, great. Well, hopefully that means that uh, most of what I said made some sense and connected with folks <clears throat> and um, folks hopefully are recognizing that natural areas, um, you know, so a, a lot of natural areas and a lot of um, municipal park systems have historically been just neglected, set aside and they figure nature will take care of itself. Um, but folks that, um, are more familiar with native plant communities, invasive species, natural disturbance regimes, conservation biology, things like that. Um, 
uh, recognize that, you know, without managing these natural areas, they will degrade and the ecosystem services or the qualities that they provide and the functions they provide to people that people appreciate and enjoy and we rely on, um, those things can be lost through the degradation of these natural areas. So um, that's a, a great result to see. And um, I think we just had one more question here for folks. <clears throat> um, and this is more about you know opportunities for learning and engagement with what's going on at Hartley. So um, give you a few minutes to take a look at that. Okay. I think everyone's I think everyone's had a chance to respond. Um, great. So a decent amount of uh, interest in invasive species and volunteer opportunities. That's wonderful. Um, we've seen just amazing work take place um, in natural areas from volunteer groups, and obviously <clears throat> Hartley is a deer park to to the city of Duluth, and and you've got a long history of volunteers helping out there. So that's great to see some uh, some of the unofficial access and trail concerns we had heard about. Um, and then stewardship while enjoying recreational activities. Great. Great. Um, so then uh, with that, I will, I think, stop talking. And we've got just some information here, um, contact information for Diane and Matt. Um, and then the city web website also has a brochure <clears throat> on the Duluth Natural Areas program, um, a really nice brochure that talks about the whole purpose of it, the history of it. Um, and again, Hartley is one of, uh, how many, Diane, how many do you have? Is it two or three natural areas that are formally designated? You may be muted or have stepped away, Diane. I didn't mean to surprise you on the spot. Um, but anyway, that brochure talks about um, the program, which is a great, great program. So encourage folks to, uh, to take a look at that brochure if you're not familiar with the program um, and contact Diane and Matt if you have any questions. And uh, we- Sorry, are... John. Okay. Sorry about that, I had a- Literally a computer fart, I'll just say it. Okay. <laughs> we, we have three, na there are three natural areas in the city. Okay. Hartley and the St. Louis River Natural Area were nominated in the last year or two. And then okay, Mamie yep. Snidely's been around since about 2003. That's right. Yeah. Great. Great. Super. Thank you. And I just hiked through the Magnus Snidely the other day. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I don't know. I didn't look at the chat yet. Sean, is there yeah, anything? Yeah, the there were a couple questions that came up. So thank you everyone for that. And feel free to continue if something comes to mind. One was, I think we addressed it in the chat box, just a question about what were the gray areas on the map that showed quality rankings. And um, I, th I think it was answered, actually in the legend, it was white. Um, but you're correct, Doug, that on the map it appears gray. So I think that's- Yeah, because the area, up. yeah, the the underlying aerial photograph. So yeah, if that wasn't clear to folks, um, I'll just click to that just to hopefully make that clear um, that uh, that those are areas that are basically they're considered to be non-native plant communities or they are so degraded that they were not given a quality rank of A through D. Mm -hmm. 
And then the other question that came up is it was a, a question of whether um, we could zoom in on the legend to maybe see a little more clearly um, what was being communicated. And I wasn't sure which map the question was referring to. We looked at a series of maps. But Doug, if you wanted to actually uh, stop sharing the screen and let me share mine, I've got a high res version open that I can uh, zoom in on. I think it was that native plant communities one, Sean, that, that Doug okay. was just last on. Um, and while you're doing that, can I, I would like to add a couple things to what Doug said. Thanks a lot for a great presentation. Um, folks that are on, um, the, the, the goal for this is to, you know, reach out to stakeholders, let, let you all know what we're working on. Um, we are going to be uh, uh, vetting this through the Natural Resource Commission, which are public meetings. So it's open for you to also uh, provide comment and feedback. And we'll be presenting the Natural Resource Commission with a draft plan, which at that point will include some more funding numbers. We're, we don't have, the city is, the Natural Resource Program is so new to the city. What we're trying to do is get our arms around what things can cost and um, so that we can start thinking about budgets as we move forward and start proposing those to our decision makers and um, um, talking more about the natural resources as a program in the city, of which this is kind of a subset of a larger program plan that we are now working on citywide. So this plan has just been a wonderful way to start thinking about this on a smaller scale as we start stepping back on a larger scale as far as how we do that. So the draft plan will be presented to the Natural Resource Commission in November, and then we'll ask them to vote on it in December for you know, approval and acceptance to move forward. It's, it's a natural plant community plan that's as far as we'll take it through commissions at this point, but any feedback or information that you want to provide that can help us make this a better plan as we move forward, we'll, is, we would love to hear from you. And I'll just add, you know, one thing about funding, at least as it has has gone so far, is, you know, all of the funding, to my understanding, that has supported the activities in terms of the highlighted areas and the buckthorn removal that Community Action Duluth, et cetera, has, has done, has been externally funded via seeking grant sources. And I think those that funding mechanism represents probably our most viable chance to continue to move this plan forward. So for all of the fiscal hawks out there thinking about our limited city budget and parks fund budget and, you know, let's fix the roads before we do anything else, just note that this, a lot of this work has and will be supported, almost all of it, not that it doesn't take Hartley staff time or city time, but has been externally funded and is not coming out of the, the city's general fund budget. Correct me if I'm wrong there, Diane. Tom, I totally agree with you. I would say that the plan we're working on right now is out of our city budget because we wanted to make sure we kicked off with the first project in the natural area program plan, but you're absolutely right. But what we're hopeful that this plan will help us do is leverage more funding, but also help us talk about what the city, you know, proposing what city needs to help us to support because we can use city dollars to also match things as well as Hartley Nature Center. If you're, um, you've got a fund going, you know, or you often have memorials or other things where people want to contribute, those dollars can be leveraged to get uh, grants to, to duplicate or to double up our efforts and sometimes triple our efforts in some of these areas. So that'll help us strategize and think this through. And we decided to just go the 10 years out and also to go with what we think we could maybe realistic do, realistically do. We gotta go back to the places we've already been or we're gonna lose all that money and time that we've already spent on. But as Doug said, we also need to focus on protecting those that are really in good shape and work our way kind of between the two. Yeah. No, well, well said, Diane. And yeah, for folks that on the call that maybe aren't aware, as Diane just alluded, and I think Tom alluded as well, having a plan like this really positions the city in a much better way to get additional grant funding. Um, 
And so, uh, and we've seen, we've seen some of our, some similar types of plans like this help folks to leverage hundreds of thousands of dollars from state grant programs and things. So not that that's gonna happen here. Um, don't wanna get hopes up, but um, certainly a plan like this can, can really position you well for that type of grant funding that can really, really launch, um, launch natural resource programs and, and management programs. Um, very the other thing it will do for us, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Doug, is, you know, as we, part of our goal is to have this cadre of volunteers that come in and we, you know, annually facilitate in non-pandemic times, uh, significant volunteer resources towards invasive species removal and plantings. And this plan gives us more of a blueprint and a framework from which to operate. So we are not just sort of scattershot going out in the park and, you know, arbitrarily focusing on this one little section. This is really our, our systematic roadmap. And so it's gonna make those volunteer uh, plantings and invasive activities a lot more focused and directed towards the, the management goal outcomes. So I think it's, it's, it's gonna be a really useful tool on a number of fronts. I, Sean, I see your, I see a couple questions here about will the maps and the, re, what, when will this be available so that we can look at it? The Natural Resource Commission is the first Wednesday of the month. Um, we, we send out a notice 10 days before that. So uh, we will have the draft report and the maps within the report ready to go then. So give us another week or so, please. Uh, we want to make sure things are, are polished to at least in draft form. And then we will make those available when we um, send out notice for the Natural Resource Commission meeting. And Diane, do you have a, a time of day for those meetings? Somebody just asked. Uh, Natural Resource Commission meeting is the first Wednesday of the month. I'm looking at, so it'll be November uh, 4th. And Judy, correct me if I'm wrong. And we meet at six o'clock. Um, you will see that online. You can go to the city website for commissions um, and uh, look us up and get get the information there. And we'll we'll have the report there too to upload and look at. Great. And just to repeat, the first Wednesday of the month, is that correct? Yes. So November fourth is the next meeting. And that's uh, when the, that'll be available. Yes. Did I get that right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions in the chat or anybody else have any other questions that uh, that they would like to discuss? Do we cover them all you think here in the chat, Sean? Yep, I, I think we're good in terms of the questions that came up. So thank you for addressing them. Feel free to unmike yourself too. We've got a small yeah. group here. Yeah, feel free. So just out of curiosity uh, from Lisa, why was trail running not included in uses of the park? And that may refer back to there was a poll question that listed several or asked how do people enjoy Hartley? I, I think one of the um, options was walking or hiking. Yeah, we had so walking I think our, and hiking. Our intention there was maybe uh, not as expansive or descriptive enough to capture all the ways that people use walking and hiking trails. So it was unintentional. Yep. All right, not seeing anything else in the chat. Um, again, any other questions or comments or feedback? We. Happy to hear it and discuss. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the folks who attended. I know about half the folks and I'm, I'm wondering about the greater public, how to um, let more people know. Um, maybe there's just a few of us that are geeks about, you know, all the invasives and all that stuff and care about it, but um, I, I, what are you thinking? Well, I know Diane, you, you had put it th through the city's website. Maybe you can just describe what you and Matt did. And, and I'm not sure if there was other. You know, Judy, we, 
Hartley is a really, really active community, and and uh, Matt Wiley and, and Tom, you know, really use the the their, the listserv for Hartley to get this word out. It and we've sent it out and sent a reminder out today, and then we also put it on the city's uh, information and Facebook and. So you're, you're right, We're, I'm always struggling with that. And um, I, I you know, let the Natural Resource Commission know, we tried to get the word out as best we could with a COVID year, but even then it's hard, even if it wasn't COVID. So we're sure open to suggestions moving forward. Yeah, I'm and We've got the two Natural Resource Commission meetings coming up for people mm -hmm. to comment on, so. Mm -hmm. And Tom or whoever from Hartley sent the email, I was really, I, I had it on my calendar, but I was frantically looking for the link and, and thanks for that email today. That was perfect. Thank that Matt. might be something to think about links, Matt. where to get those links. That's the point. Yeah, the only, I mean, I guess from our amplification standpoint, we put, we did put it out on our social media and we sent an email to our constant contact cohort. Um, you know, I guess the only thing we really didn't do was put notices like on the park kiosks themselves to try to sort of get it in front of people who are out there recreating. But um, yeah, anyway, we're open to other suggestions and ways we can spread the word. Somebody just commented they saw this on the next door listserv. So the, the next door uh, social network, I believe is what that's referring to. Great. Oh. So right. that's great. That sounds like people are maybe kind of organically spreading yeah. the word, which is what we hope for. Yeah, great. In terms of on site, like you said, uh, Tom, at on kiosks or at, at the site itself, I think we have the ability to generate a QR code. You know that you would scan with your smartphone that would, um, you know, go to the link. So if you ever did. Um, want to put anything up, you know, outdoors that would be easy for people to access, we could try something like that. Oh, well, that's good to know. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll wear a sandwich board and walk around <laughs> the park uh, in the days leading up to it. My stomach growled when you said sandwich. <laughs> It's my vote. <laughs> well, if there's nothing else folks have, questions or discussion points, Diane, anything else you wanted to cover? Or? Nope, I, th I, I think we're good. Please uh, um, spread the word about the Natural Resource Commission meeting on November 4th. If folks want to hear more, Doug will be giving um, this kind of a draft overview. He might get into a little bit more detail. We'll have more about the kind of rough estimates of what we're thinking about costs. Yep. All right, great. Well, thank you everybody. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us and for the questions and comments and discussion points. And uh, hopefully see some of you folks on the, at the Natural uh, Resources Commission meeting. This was great. Thanks all. Thanks all. Take care. Bye, thank you. <laughs>